Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have with me again Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and OpenMPI. Hey, Brock, good afternoon. Uh, this one's, this one's going to be a good one. It's kind of near and dear to my heart because uh, in my role as a, you know, a parallel systems developer guy, I've got about 50-plus uh, nodes at, at Cisco that I use for development and testing. And uh, I am I am low enough on the peon scale that I don't get any technicians or sysadmins to to help me out and keep these things running. So I have to do it all myself. And so any tools that can help me do this are are very greatly appreciated. And I want to hear about them. Yeah. So the uh, tool is a uh, BCFG two, um, and we have with us two people who work on that. We have um, Naran Desai and Corey. Leaning Hainer, um, and I think they're both from Argonne National Laboratory outside Chicago. So, guys, welcome to the show. Hi, hello. So, go ahead and introduce yourself. Say your name and say a little bit about you know how you got started. Uh, I'm Narayan Desai. I uh, I work at the uh, Mathematics and Computer Science Division at Argonne National Laboratory, and I'm a uh, uh, sort of a half step between a system administrator and a system software developer. So I uh, uh, work on system management software and things of, of that sort. Um, basically, when I started working on Bconfig, I was a system administrator responsible for a variety of HPC systems around MCS, and we needed something to help us cope with the configuration uh, complexity and scale that we were seeing at that point. This was uh, in 2002. And I'm uh, Corey Leaning Hainer. I'm one of the system administrators on working with the uh, the leadership computing facility here at Argonne, working on our big 40 rack blue gene system and the uh, uh, visualization cluster that goes with it, and all the file servers and login servers and all the the extra support pieces that go into keeping a large HPC resource alive. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of intro, um, maybe a little bit about where BCFG came from? Um, so uh, we call it bconfig. Uh, basically, uh, when I started out here at the lab, I was a system administrator responsible for a bunch of the large-scale HPC systems here. Uh, we had, at the time, a relatively large cluster. It was about 320 nodes uh, called Chiba City and uh, a small administrative staff. And uh, basically configuration problems, right? So we were supporting a group of computer scientists that were doing development on uh, a variety of, of sorts of system software, uh, HPC system software, and numerical libraries and things of that sort. And these researchers needed access to a wide array of types of machines and large machines and things of that sort. And so we needed tools to be able to effectively manage uh, both uh, heterogeneity in our environment and uh, configuration complexity that you would see from requirements from a lot of different sorts of users. So these so what days I've moved sort of a little bit more towards uh, system software development. And so uh, basically the transition has been from a system administrator to halfway between system administration and software development, which I think is actually a really interesting place to be. Cool. So so uh, actually I'm glad to hear you call it bconfig because to me BCFG2 just – doesn't really roll off the tongue very easily. And when I was Googling around for uh, information, you know, preparing for this interview here, I, I found all kinds of things about natural gas sizes. Yeah, so uh, I started working on Bconfig in about uh, 2002, and uh, picking Googleable names was not at that point uh, uh, an important thing to consider when naming software. And so I realized about a year later when I actually did a public release and, and started uh, uh, seeing – you know, actual external visibility for bconfig that when you searched for it, you got a billion cubic feet of gas. And it wasn't a term that I was previously familiar with. Uh, it's a very Let, let's hope that your software doesn't produce a billion cubic feet of gas. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, it uh, uh, the thing that's really kind of funny at this point, people always sort of grumble about the name because it doesn't actually uh, communicate much about what bconfig is other than it has something to do with configuration. And, gotcha. uh, where, where does the two come from? Because on the on the logo on your website, is that a squared or is that a two? Uh, it's it's a two. Uh, there was a bconfig one, and it was a, a miserable failure. Uh, and basically, it got to the point that it was deployed on a bunch of systems here at the lab, but it wasn't very flexible. And when you actually tried to extend it from uh, a single 
sort of small group of administrators to a larger group with a more complicated environment, it really didn't work very well um, flexibility-wise. And so we scrapped it and went and redesigned the way that it worked. We kept a bunch of things about the overall operational model, but but made it uh, more flexible and, and replaced it with a, an implementation that scaled better. So this is actually version two of bconfig. We're actually okay, getting so close to version one of version two. Clearly, I don't have this story very clear. <laughs> Clearly. So what does the B in bconfig stand for? Well, originally, uh, the idea was built around this notion of validation. So uh, the basic idea was that you want to have something equivalent to diff and patch for configuration, right? So you have a machine, you've got two machines, and one of them is different from the other, and you want to be able to say, how are these machines different? Or given this difference between machine A and machine B, let's apply it to machine B, right? So intuitively, that's a pretty simple idea. And the, once I started digging into this sort of conceptual model, the thing that I realized is that we needed some sort of validation mechanism to build a configuration from a machine. And so uh, as you start looking at the way that software gets layered onto machines, uh, you frequently have uh, an artifact on the machine where you take something like an RPM and then you reconfigure it with some configuration files and you associate that with a service that you've turned on. And all of those things are very interdependent. And so we call those bundles in bconfig. And so the B originally stood for bundle. And so it's bundle configuration tool. Um, it's not a particularly meaningful aspect of bconfig at this point. But the name has kind of rolled forward with us. Plus, it gives us that billion cubic feet of gas Google hit. Yeah, there you go. I, I guess if you actually want that. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, okay, so does bconfig get involved anywhere with installing, or do you, when installing, say, like, some bare metal, do you still rely on, like, kickstart or auto yes or something like that, and then you just call bconfig? Like, is bconfig something you automate or not? I mean, where does it get used? So it's, it's very useful at that point. If you're starting out, say, building a cluster, and you have all the bare metal sitting around there, if you've predefined what uh, classes of machines you want, then it does drop in after the kickstart or whatever building phase you have. So whatever whatever distribution you're using, the uh, method it uses to build machines, you build just a base machine for all of the different styles you want. If you want compute machines or login servers or management machines or whatever, you can build them all from the same kickstart uh, image, and then bconfig will, will run on top of that to turn everything into the individual types of machines that you want. Is it Sorry. Linux only? Uh, no, it's not. It's actually uh, used on Solaris and OS X to some extent. We have some interest in Windows port, but we haven't actually uh, put any time into that. There are some folks around the lab that are actually really interested in that, but we don't have any usable software at this point on Windows. And generally, it's POSIX. So if you support POSIX, then bconfig can do useful things for you. Okay, so does bconfig redo everything or does it just rely on the underlying packet managers and stuff like that like does it just support rpm and the you know the osx packages and things like that or is it something more like like i don't know i don't know if you ever heard of a tool called radmind which literally tracks by the file and it checks some on that file and you lose track of all the rpm data right so it doesn't work like radmind does um okay so it actually has integration logic to talk to different package management systems and service management systems and things of that sort. Uh, and then there's a driver to talk to POSIX backends, right? So, for example, uh, we have package management drivers for uh, apt, for RPM, for uh, OSX packages that are... The OSX package driver, I'm not sure if it ever got integrated um, because the functionality there, it, it doesn't give you everything that you'd want. But we have fully functional drivers for uh, Solaris System 5 packages, IPS, um, Gen2 uh, package management, and all of the service management systems on those platforms are uh, well supported as well. Huh, okay, so you rely on the natural. So can you do like hierarchical kind of configurations? Like say I have a, two different classes of login nodes, say like a GPU login node. Can I kind of say like the GPU... Cl login node inherits from the login node? In yeah, the exactly. You can? Okay. So I don't have so, to like repeat myself for things that are common on a single system. Right. So bconfig 
uh, is actually it might be useful to describe the basic architecture of bconfig. So it's a client server model. The client is responsible for uh, basically taking the configuration specification it gets from the server, validating the current state of the client, figuring out a, con- a reconfiguration path between where it is and where the server says it should be, and then performing those options or not depending on the command line options supplied to the client, right? So if you're in dry run mode, it won't do the changes and things of that sort. On the server side, there are uh, definitions for what machines should look like. And this might include things like uh, a group that's associated with login nodes or compute nodes or GPU nodes or whatever. And then you can build what are called profiles, which are combinations of groups that describe the attributes of a given machine. And so in the example that you were describing, basically what you would probably end up with is two different profile groups, one for login nodes and one for GPU login nodes, <laughs> and then a series of groups that, that are included in those profiles. So there might be a, a group associated with GPUs that would you would share on uh, you would sorry you would uh, include on all of your machines that had GPUs regardless of whether they were login nodes or not and then you can basically add the bits for GPUs to the bits for login if that makes sense sounds a lot like inheritance yeah it it, it basically works like inheritance there are a couple of, of uh, uh, details that are slightly different but by and large yeah and multiple inheritance clearly works. Okay, so how do you how do you specify these things? I, I admit I was trolling through your website before, um, and it's, I saw you know references to a configuration file. I, I didn't dive deep enough to see what it is, but you know how do you specify you know how this stuff you know is configured? Do you list it by RPMs? Do you list by RPMs and files? I mean, can you mix the package managers and um, you know how do you? Yeah, well, how do you specify <laughs> first? Well, so uh, the, the structure of these bconfig specifications basically amounts to a series of uh, entities that describe a given sort of atom in the configuration. And these atoms are all typed, right? So you might have packages or services or config files or things of that sort. And these can be mixed. And the um, basically, uh, things like package or service, uh, those entries have types that associate them with the drivers on the client side. So in some cases, you actually end up with machines that have multiple package management systems or multiple service management systems. Uh, The way that, say, Solaris systems look with a combination of SMF and legacy services are are an example of this. And so you need to be able to use both drivers at the same time. And so uh, that's all supported through the system. Um, the, The way that this looks on the server side is that you, you build this configuration specification that includes a bunch of definitions. So say, for example, you, uh, you want SSH on all of your machines, and you want a particular SSHD configuration. The way that this would end up looking in your configuration is that there would be a rule saying, if you're running, Red, or if you're running RHEL 5, this is the version of the SSH package that you should get. And it's of type RPM, and it has this version, and things of that sort. And then... Uh, in a different place, you would have a configuration file that RHEL 5 system should get you know, for sshd.conf, or sshd config. And uh, for sshd config, you can actually go through and use groups to define different configurations. So say if your login machines allowed logins from a particular set of locations or didn't allow root logins or things of that sort... You could then register multiple instances of the SSHD config with bconfig, and that would be served out as appropriate to clients and, and merged into their configuration. So to say the same thing in a different way, bconfig has a concept of what a package is and what a config file is and what a service is and what, what all these individual things that live on a computer are and has the ability to aggregate those together for interdependencies. So it, you can tell it that the SSHD service depends on the SSH package, which also depends on the individual configuration file you've put together. So you can take all of the individual pieces that exist on uh, on your machine given to you by the distribution, put them together into the bundle, which then it knows how to install on the different classes of machines that, that you've defined in the uh, hierarchy of, of groups for that uh, inheritance bit. Cool. Okay. So... 
that actually sounds <laughs> genuinely useful. What is what is the security model here? Because obviously a lot of this stuff is going to have to execute as root. So do you assign commands back and forth or authenticate some other way? How do you know? How can I know? that um, you know, this client is talking to an authenticated server and vice versa? So we use HTTPS with SSL certs. Um, the, the thing that we've actually found kind of tricky in uh, cluster environments is that the bootstrapping problem is a real issue for people when they're doing multi-hundred node installs. And so we've basically implemented uh, everything up to client-side certs so clients are authenticated based on their certs, and the server has a cert, and everything is signed by a CA and, and so forth. Um, but there are also lower modes of security that can be used in situations where they are appropriate. So it's sort of the best of both worlds. So Beacon Fig, you mentioned before, it's uh, you know you were talking about a cluster environment. I assume that also kind of translates well into you know, other kind of data center applications as well. But uh, do you also target you know, the desktop environment as long as they're of the, the POSIX flavor? Uh, yeah, actually, originally when we developed Beaconfig, we were thinking mainly about a cluster environment. But once we had it working well in our clusters, we found that it actually satisfied most of the requirements that we had in our sort of desktop workstation environment as well. And so we've deployed it across everything at this point. And the... Um, uh, we've actually been really surprised by the wide range of environments that Beaconfig has been deployed at in production. I mean, we see basically everything from sort of web-style shops to cloud stuff to finance and, you know, other stuff in the national labs and clusters. And and then, you know, every once in a while you see that guy with uh, 20 machines that runs Beaconfig. And so we get really the whole range. Okay, I'm actually curious about the scale of loading some of these systems um, does does the bconfig server itself actually host the system native packages like would I actually dump the RPMs and bconfig moves them to the client or is that handled some other way I, well so generally that's handled through handled through the uh, underlying uh, package management plumbing and so uh, bconfig doesn't p- provide the transport for that. Um, in some cases, those resources are co-located on the Beaconfig server, um, but that's not universally the case. And if you need more bandwidth, you you can always move it to a different location. Okay, because uh, that was the next Beaconfig question. Just pass through through URLs and things like that. Okay, yeah, because that was going to be the next question. I mean, what what do you do when one loading server for like doing you know a thousand machines at a time is no longer large enough? But it's so like, for example, if I'm running RHEL. Um, it would just be config would just tell the clients use this yum repo exactly okay and i can just set up however many yum repos and they could be a local nfs mount or http or anything right yeah exactly so completely flexible my choice yep no, all right so that actually scales out pretty well because then your bconfig server is just really a metadata server. You're sending out instructions and config files, and, and relatively speaking, that's probably not a lot of data, and you could scale up to a very large number of clients. Is that a correct assumption? Yeah, these uh, configurations tend to be relatively small, uh, and of the volume in the configuration specifications, the thing that we've seen that usually tends to be the largest is in large environments, your SSH known host file gets pretty big. But, you know, we're still talking on the order of maybe a megabyte of data per client. Okay, yeah, and so, the, you know, the bulk of, of data movement is really, you know, like through Yum or Yast or, or something else. And you can set that up in whatever scalable fashion you, you need for the number of clients you've got. Is that kind of what people tend to do? Yep. It also makes it really easy to start integrating Beaconfig into an environment where you already are using Yum or Apt or whatever you have for the underlying package management. You can easily bring Beaconfig in, define all of your packages, and since it's running on top of the same thing, you're not actually changing anything on the machines. You've just got an extra layer to help you manage them. So then how does Beaconfig differ from something like, say, Red Hat's satellite server? Well, the major way that Beaconfig is different is this validation model that I talked about a little bit earlier. So uh, many of the 
other configuration management systems that exist out there, including the Red Hat up-to-date kind of stuff, are mainly imperatively driven. And so uh, in some cases, that means that explicitly there are commands that are pushed out that are executed on clients, uh, or that the the, um, the semantics of the protocol between the clients and server is, is functionally imperative in nature. A bconfig is a declarative tool. So the specification that gets passed to clients is a set of descriptions of the way it should be configured, not a set of steps to make it be configured in that fashion, if that makes sense. Um, basically, the idea here is um, to let the bconfig client handle the hard problems of figuring out the transitioning between states. And then that way, if you have a client that is in an unexpected initial configuration, it's easier uh, to robustly handle uh, the reconfiguration process. So it will this verify. Describe, but... Okay, so, so bconfig will verify. So that's actually a, a nice thing, because like, can you actually run bconfig almost like in a tripwire kind of mode, like run it from cron and notify yourself when something's not quite you know, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so this is actually a really interesting thing. Someone pointed out that uh, early on that you can actually run bconfig without any configuration specification, and it can tell you things about your machine, right? Because it supports these discovery mechanisms, it can look at things like what services are enabled on which systems and which packages are installed and which clients and things of that sort. That means that... Uh, you can uh, uh, you can basically so so yes you can kind of use it like tripwire the the thing that makes it slightly different from tri tripwire is that it doesn't go down to such a low level sort of security focus right we try to keep things at kind of a, a high level to provide useful data to um, sysadmins right so if someone goes out to a machine and upgrades a version of a package you'll see that the version of the package was upgraded, not that 852 files were changed. Okay. But what if that machine is not supposed to have a package on it? Will bconfig actually remove it? Uh, it can. So it will detect it, and depending on the mode that you run the... I mean, so this is one of those things where we find that there is near-violent disagreement between our users. <laughs> Some of them absolutely want the bconfig client to remove those packages, and other ones are completely terrified of bconfig removing those packages. And so both modes are supported. Okay. Here's another uh, common configuration issue I, I would imagine comes up. What happens when you've got the smart local administrator, right? So, so let's say you're doing, um, well, it could even be an HPC cluster, but probably more apt for a, a desktop kind of environment where somebody uh, you know, locally installs their own RPM and possibly it even conflicts with something that bconfig said should be on there. Well, what, do you, what do you do? So there are a variety of different modes that you can deploy bconfig in. Uh, as you guys mentioned earlier, one of the actually really popular ways to, defo to deploy bconfig is to run it in dry run mode most of the time. So uh, a secondary part of the system is a, a reporting subsystem. And basically the way that this reporting subsystem works is every time a client uh, phones home, it gets its configuration specification, it figures out the actions that it could take, and it may perform some of those actions depending on the mode that it's running in. After it's finished doing whatever it's going to do, it uploads its current conformance to the, uh, uh, the configuration specification back to the server. And this information is stored in a database and there's a web front end and all that kind of stuff. That means, and this, this data uh, that gets uploaded contains everything from extra packages that may be installed, incorrect versions of packages that may be installed, uh, dips between the versions of config files that are on the system and the version that the bconfig server thinks should be on the system, right? And so this is actually very close to the conceptual notion of a configuration diff that I talked about earlier. And that the there are actually tools on the server side to take that and render it into configuration rules on the server side. That's a, a, a process that requires the use of, of an administrator's expertise in order to figure out where and why well, why that change was made and which client group it applies to. So we don't generally do that in, a, uh, in any sort of automated fashion, but there are uh, programs to streamline that process. And so there are a variety of sorts of configuration patterns that you might want in your network. So the one that everybody thinks of to start with is kind of a star pattern where you have 
one source of, of sort of truth, if you will, and configuration changes get pushed out to all clients from there. And in some sense, this is the simplest uh, workflow to support because you don't need to worry about pre-existing state and capturing any data. You just need to worry about turning the pre-existing state into the desired state. Another model that you can have is the exact opposite of that, where the bconfig client runs in dry run mode, collects all sorts of information about the client configuration, and sends that to the server where it can then be processed and merged into the configuration specification by an administrator. And so if you basically have a group of development machines where people are making deliberate changes to configurations all the time, you may want to run in that mode. It'll probably be system administrator intensive to do that, but all the plumbing is in place to, to do that and to sort, sort of support combinations of those two models where you have particular clients that um, changes are being made locally on and, and those changes get pulled back upstream through a, an automated, not an automated, uh, uh, an assisted process. Okay, so you kind of hinted on, actually, uh, even earlier in this in this conversation, you've hinted on, um, you know, the, applying the diffs of, of configuration information, and and I think from what you're saying, it sounds like you know you're examining a, a wide variety of things, and you have a smart client that knows how to apply the diffs. So, for example, you look and you say, oh, there's lib foo version one two three, but the configuration says I'm supposed to have version 456, then you'll do an RPM-U or, or whatever is appropriate to, to do that. And since you know this is an RPM, it'll do an RPM update. But if it's a local configuration file, either, either copy a new one or apply a diff to that file and then kick the server to restart it or something like that, is that about right? I mean, you have kind of these uh, you know drivers that you mentioned earlier for the different packaging systems and they all kind of have a general engine that they follow for upgrading and removing and editing and gathering and things like that? Sounds like you're ready to become a bconfig user. You've got it all down. <laughs> well, like I said, it's, it's because I have to man- manually uh, administrate my own cluster. I get more <laughs> exposure to system administration than I, than I really should. So, yeah, that is the, uh, the, the general way that things go. You hit the, uh, the server has an idea of what versions of packages are available, what's the latest one and everything. The clients have their knowledge of what they have. They ask the, the server what you got, and it sends back. And uh, the, on the clients, the, the, if, if it's installing a package, it'll do the RPM upgrade, the apt install, whatever needs to be done. And then anything that has changed due to that will get checked one more time. If config files that go with those, they might have changed because the uh, the package might have obliterated what you had there. They'll check that, make sure that the config files associated with that bundle are actually correct. Check the services, restart them if they need to, if you're running SSH or, or NTP bundle with things like that, that that you need to restart the server when a new package or new config file comes and then reports back to the server. I'm all clean so you can look at it uh, in your reports and know that you've got a nice uh, clean set of machines on your network. So I have a different question. We're talking about difference between what the server expects and what the client expects. What about within the server? For example... I have a set of updates I want to apply to a bunch of login nodes. I apply them. I find they're incorrect. Does bconfig have the idea of go back to the way everything looked 12 hours ago? So generally the way that we handle that is we keep the repository under some sort of version control system. And going back from the perspective of the server is uh, a matter of changing the specification from version X of, of you know, package lib foo to version y of package lib foo. And then we count on the underlying uh, package management and service management tools on the client side to do the requisite downgrading. And so I have kind of a funny story. This is actually back when we were working on bconfig1. Uh, someone messed up a configuration for a machine that was running uh, a test of Debian Sarge. And the production environment here was Debian Woody at that point. And uh, the rules on the server side got changed so to basically describe this system as no longer running Debian Sarge, but running Debian Woody. And the bconfig client dutifully downgraded all the packages, and when we next logged into it, it was running Woody again. You know, this is a, a, a kind of an outlier, but the, uh, the server supports everything that it needs to be able to do that kind of thing. Cool. Okay. 
but I can't look inside bconfig and actually say, okay, here's the way it looked. You're relying on the revision control system to just kind of keep track of your bconfig configs. Um, well, so we rely on the, the version control system to keep track of the repository state. Uh, the reporting system actually keeps historical data about the state of the clients at a, a given point in time. And so you could actually go and reconstruct. If you realize, for example, that the machines weren't clean at the time of the upgrade and they had the incorrect version of libfoo, you could then go and look at the reporting database and figure out which version they had been running. It's more of an okay. auditing system. Okay. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it sounds like you're using, uh, you know, building blocks of other tools where it's appropriate because, you know, there, for as many different version control systems that are out there, you know, there's a lot of different philosophies on how to do it. Do you want a central repo? You want distributed repo? And, you know, also why why duplicate that functionality in in bconfig when there's uh, a bajillion other tools that that do it very well? I mean, I, I would imagine you also have to resist the kind of feature creep to, you know. Keep it a configuration management tool, not, for example, a, a health monitoring tool. I, I could see an, an easy temptation to uh, say, oh, well, I can put network checks in during while I'm checking all the software and make sure that, you know, the, uh, the InfiniBand or iWarp or MirrorNet or whatever it is you've got is up and running properly and put that in the database, too. Do you get kind of feature requests like that? From time to time. Uh, there is, I mean, so one of the mechanisms that the... Um that the client supports is the use of client-side probes. And so uh, probes are basically a way for a client to assert information about itself in the bconfig metadata that you can then use for configuration generation. And this is everything from you might want to probe system architecture or probe the hardware configuration of machines or things of that sort. Uh, and this happens before the configuration specification is generated. People have done all sorts of interesting slash horrific things in there to pass information around uh, in different cases that might be better served by a monitoring system. But one of the things that I've really learned over the last uh, seven or eight years through the process of working on Beaconfig is that it's really hard to come up with hard and fast rules that sort of describe all system administration situations. There are a lot of weird requirements out there, and, and sometimes having a, a full-fledged monitoring system isn't necessarily possible for some reason. And so in a pinch, it can be used. I wouldn't recommend it, but I'm, I'm sort of <clears throat> nervous about saying that you absolutely shouldn't do it either. That's fair enough. I, I, I was on mute, so you didn't hear me, but I laughed very loud when you said interesting slash horrific. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Well, that's um, how you know you've made it, right? But when somebody's right, using, some, using your using tool it. for something that you, A, could not have predicted, and B, you're not quite so sure about. <laughs> yeah, that's right. When people start using bconfig as an email client, then you will have made it, yes. Um, so a follow-up question on that. So you mentioned these probes and, and things like that. How are, how are probes implemented? Do you have them kind of as plugins? Is it easy for people to add their own probes? Like, you know, I do have either a wacko package management or I only want to apply this configuration if you have a particular kind of hardware or, or something along those lines? Is it easy to extend like that? So the, uh, the, the probes functionality is very easy to extend. It's just a shell script that you, roll, that you want to be run on your clients, and whatever your shell script returns, whatever it uh, sends out to standard out, gets pumped back up to the server, and then the server side... You can use templates or, or other plugins on the server side to, to chop that up and do whatever you want with it. And so it can be as simple as your probe goes at, off and asks what video card is installed in your machine so that you can decide whether you want to install the NVIDIA drivers, the ATI drivers, or whatever weird piece of hardware you have, up to asking it for a full hardware inventory or what its uptime has been or whatever you need to do crazy things inside of the uh, the templating engine or the other plugin engines on the, the server side. So these different classes that can inherit from each other, can I say in a larger site have like a group of sysadmins that are responsible for just providing stock Red Hat 5 and then delegate to other people, okay, you can set up you can play in your own little area over here and put your custom configs on top of this, but you can't touch this other groups. 
or is that normally handled with multiple bconfig installations? At this point, a majority of that kind of stuff is handled with bconfig installations, but we're pretty sure that it could be implemented using uh, version control system uh, commit hook kind of things, right? The basic mechanism that you would use for that is you would define a series of groups that correspond to the different sort of support responsibilities and then static priority levels for them. And you would enforce the fact that any check-in of new configuration rules corresponded to a group that for which this user was authorized at a priority that this group should always apply at. But effectively, what this amounts to is process, right? When you actually try to start doing distributed stuff, uh, you quickly end up sort of in the weeds of figuring out what your process should be and who's actually responsible for what and how this should actually work. And so that ends up being actually more complicated than the technical aspects usually. Okay. And this is actually on a different kind of point. Do you see bconfig used often on uh, diskless systems? So we do actually, in a bunch of cases, the... Um, the major benefit is that it provides a uh, a fairly flexible mechanism to describe your different roles, right? And so if you end up with a differentiated system, um, you still get a lot of mileage out of the fact that you can describe a relatively sophisticated configuration uh, compactly. And, those, okay, and so effective, effectively, those configurations can. The only difference is that those configurations can be worked on offline, right? You don't need to actually do reconfiguration operations on the the clients themselves. Sort of similar to yeah, VMs. I, a, a reconfigure operation would just be a reboot, then, right? Exactly. Well, the yeah, okay. yeah. That's that's one way of looking at it. Um, here's a question out of left field. Here, what, what's the biggest installation of bconfig that you're aware of? And when I say biggest, I guess I'm, I'm asking in terms of number of clients. Uh, well, uh, so the Pleiades system at NASA is the largest one that I know of. So that was, uh, I think, number three on the top 500 list last November. Okay. That top I, 500 I list actually was a really good uh, uh, list for us because we had two systems in the top five. Oh, cool. How many, how many nodes was that? Do you remember? Uh, 65, 6,600 nodes. Cool. Um, All right. The what is, so sorry, the typical configurations we end up seeing are uh, in the sort of 300 to 2,000 node range. And you can actually okay. scale out to multiple servers and things like that if you need to. Okay, actually, that's exactly my next question. So when you say multiple servers, do you mean multiple configuration servers, metadatas that federate each other, or what, what do you mean by that? Generally, you just synchronize their versions of the repository with your version control system, and then you can run multiple instances of the bconfig server that different client pools talk to. Oh, nice. Well, that's a, a good use of, of building blocks there. Okay. Well, let me let me ask you, uh, again, another somewhat random question here. These are coming from my notes, all the things that we've talked about and I wanted to go back and ask more about. What what kind of tools does bconfig give you out of the box? Like, let's say I've I've gone to deploy it. Uh, assumedly, there's a, a, a rich set of commands that I can use. You made a fleeting reference to a, a GUI web front end kind of thing. What, what kind of tools would uh, an administrator have to play with? Uh, well, when you initially deploy bconfig, what you have is a, uh, a server-side daemon that reads a file system directory hierarchy that contains configuration rules. And then there's a client-side tool that can be used to validate the client configuration, install configuration changes, uh, and then report its state up to the server. Um, the next thing to set up is the reporting system, which is a database backend uh, a back-ended web app that you can use to look at the current states of clients and, and their past states. Uh, then there are also a variety of server-side command line tools for interacting with the repository, verifying it, interrogating it about what it would do in particular situations and things of that sort. Okay, so actually I want to back up a little bit. So when you said the largest install, you referred to the largest number of clients being managed. I'm actually curious for a single B configura 
installation the largest number of classes as like unique configuration setups for groups of hosts? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I can say that for our configurations or for configurations that users have shared, we've easily seen upwards of 75 or 100 profile groups, which are these uh, sort of classes of functionality that clients are directly associated with. Um, the number of groups in these configurations, which basically correspond to aspects of the nodes themselves, you can end up seeing uh, several hundred in your repositories. Actually, one of the tools, getting back to the previous question that Jeff asked, uh, one of the tools that we've got is a, a, uh, a program that analyzes your bconfig metadata and generates graph biz output, which is then suitable for uh, printing on your plotter for wall display because generally there are several hundred nodes in your graph. Oh, fantastic. So we've actually found that that tool is really useful for providing new administrators with a map of what's actually going on on the machines and how machines are similar to one another and what roles they play. I would imagine it's also excellent fodder for all the pointy-haired managers. You can They can say, hey, what's our machine look like? And you can just point right at it and say, there it is, sir. And they say, excellent, and walk away. Uh, in, in some cases, it can be used to scare auditors as well. Yes, we, we, uh, <laughs> we keep a copy of it laying around so that we can show it to the auditors to show, yep, we know what our machine is looking like and what all the machines are doing, and here's all the packages that are on them and everything. Okay, so what's the strangest use to be config you've ever seen? I'm guessing, you know, some strange device out there that happens to be POSIX compliant what have you actually seen people use it on besides a traditional desktop setup? Well, um, so there's, I, I think Corey's going to give me a funny look when I start talking about this, but there's a machine that we built here that's kind of fun. Uh, so it's a cluster that uh, CS researchers can check out nodes on, and basically the nodes are built on the fly, configured for them, and they have uh, a variety of custom, or not custom, but high-end networking hardware, InfiniBand, Miranet, that kind of thing, GPUs. It's basically our hardware zoo. And we actually use bconfig in that in order to support handing out dynamic root privileges to the user that's allocated the node and uh, providing custom configurations and things like that when they're needed. So that's a, uh, an example of a highly dynamic environment that's been managed. And it's kind of a, a, a cool thing, at least for folks doing uh, HPC systems research, because this is something that a lot of our users have said that they've wanted in the past. Right? It's sort of like clouds without virtualization. I think that the, the, the most unexpected, strange things that I personally run into are the, the uh, interesting templates that people write up. Every once in a while, I'll run across somebody who's written up some strange thing that I would have never thought of. Their people are using templates to do account management to create all of their accounts and and uh, delete them when they need to, all of that. Uh, doing static uh, network configuration so you don't have to bother having a DHCP server that might go down in an environment where you don't want it. The, uh, the All of the, the sort of things that can come up where I've written a, a programming language and now people are going to do crazy things with it fit in with the templating engine that people will put out strange configurations generated in strange ways that uh, aren't always the, the way that you always, that you intended them to be in the first place. So one cool template that's sort of an example uh, of what Corey is talking about. A student this summer wrote a template that would go out to machines and it would make sure that the machines were only running the set of kernels that were specified on the kernel, or sorry, uh, specified on the server side, and any kernels that they currently had booted, so that you would never end up in the case where you had a machine that was running a kernel that it no longer had modules for. And he did this with a combination of templating and probes to figure out what the current kernel was. Um, but you see all sorts of interesting and weird stuff in the templating space. Corey's definitely got that one on the head. So uh, this actually brings up a different idea. This system of having bconfig kind of dynamically change things how do you talk to it? Because I could definitely see like having Moab, a, a cluster scheduler, actually reading in like this job says I need this configuration set, and it 
actually tells bconfig, oh hey, um, blow away this node and install this pr class on it. Can you actually do stuff like that? Uh, that's actually exactly what we're doing with, it's not Moab, but it's uh, a resource manager called Cobalt that's written here at Argon. Um, we're doing that on this machine called Breadboard right now. Uh, basically what happens is when the user schedules their job, they submit which OS it should run with. And at that point, the machine gets provisioned. And it doesn't actually get provisioned through Bconfig. We actually were very careful to make sure that Bconfig didn't end up in that business because provisioning machines is a really, really ugly process, particularly if you support multiple architectures or you know, change hardware at some point in the future. Things get really hairy. So um, we've got a, a real thin provisioning system that uses System Imager to push out node images, and that gets called dynamically when, node, when a job starts. And that system imager image actually calls into bconfig in the same way that you would from kickstart in the post install. Okay. Um, so what what's coming into future to bconfig? Well, so we're literally uh, hopefully a couple of weeks away from a 1.0 release candidate. Uh, and 1.0 is uh, substantially better than the current production release of bconfig. Uh, it's considerably faster. And it supports a lot more flexible things like, um, so I, I've described the metadata system in a little bit uh, of detail. Basically, all the things that we've talked about so far are uh, introspection so that a client's configuration reflects things about that client. The new capabilities that we've added in 1.0, a lot of them have to do with giving constructs so that templates can not only reflect things about the client, but reflect things about other clients or collections of clients. So for example, one of the things that you can do with 1.0 now is you can say, when you're configuring NTP, you should actually configure all NTP clients to point at all the clients that are currently NTP servers and things of that sort. So uh, someone down the hall here has written a template that completely configures Ganglia either for multicast or for unicast using templates and client group memberships and everything else happens automatically. Cool. So, so yeah, we're really excited about 1.0. It, it provides a, 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 a more interesting level of flexibility where you can really describe not just commonalities in configuration, but your overall patterns of configuration across your machine. And so we're working up an example repository for clusters specifically that we're trying to, to make suitable for all of our clusters here at, in MCS. And, um, and, and hopefully most of that will be suitable for publication. Uh, just, you know, you need to worry sometimes, but we can get most of the private stuff out of it pretty easily. Uh, just don't share the config files that have the important stuff, you know. <laughs> Hide the secrets. So what license do you guys re release this stuff under? Uh, Beaconfig is BSD licensed. Okay. And, and uh, what, what's kind of your development model for this? Are you the two main guys, or do you have people who submit patches to you? Or you know, how, do well, you, so, how do you do that? Um, so I'm the development lead. There are about a half a dozen people that send out patches periodically. Um, what we've frequently – I mean, our goal originally – I mean, so it, it's – actually really interesting writing software for system administrators because um, at least I found that uh, system administrators tend to be very concerned about things that will break on them in the middle of their production operations. And so our goal is actually that users should not be writing code. That said, we frequently have people come in and write new features or submit bug fixes or things like that. But that's I just want to emphasize that that's not part of using bconfig on a regular basis. Um, the development community consists of me and uh, probably uh, three or four other people that I get patches from on a regular basis, and then uh, an irregular group of three or four more that I get patches from from time to time. Um, the, uh, the user community, uh, I don't know, we've got an IRC channel, and I think there were 42 people in it earlier today. Um, so bconfig is, is used by a, a moderate number of sites. I don't really have a sense of scale, you know, uh, and, and since bconfig is included with a bunch of Linux distributions, we don't actually know who's downloading it and using it. Oddly enough, I only found out that NASA was using it for Pleiades on the SC show floor last year. 
right? So <laughs> you, you don't always know who's using it for what. And, and I found that sysadmins in a lot of cases, particularly if they're in commercial environments, are um, hesitant to actually share what they're doing. So we don't actually have very good data, um, but we know of upwards of a, a easily 100 deployments of bconfig in a variety of environments and things of that sort. Yeah, this is, a, this is a pretty common answer we get back from a lot of open source projects. And we have the same exact issue in OpenMPI. I mean, you ask, how many users do OpenMPI have? I, I couldn't tell you uh, right. for all the exact same reasons that you just cited. Um, so random question uh, that I ask all, since I'm a developer myself, uh, and I ask this to all other uh, people, open source developers that we interview, what uh, version control system do you use and why? Well, originally, back in the old, old days, we used BitKeeper. And we liked that a lot until the license uh, got difficult for us being at the lab. Um, right, until, until it was no longer cool, unfortunately. Right. Uh, then we switched to Subversion because of Track, largely. And so we've been using that, though, um, at this point, I'm using Git SVN. To access the to commit into the, the subversion repository, and I'm doing all of my development in Git, as are uh, at least one or two of the other sort of core developers. So I think that we're in the process of transitioning to Git, but we haven't quite gotten the um, Git isn't supported by where we are hosting our code right now in MCS, and so as that changes, I su suspect we will be migrating. Okay, guys, so. How about some contact information, um, website, IRC channel, you know, wh where can people find bconfig? Uh, so we are at bconfig2.org, bcfg2.org, and uh, uh, we are in pound bconfig2 on uh, Freenode. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. This was, this was really informative, and actually I'm going to have to check this out myself. So. Th thanks a lot, thanks, guys, guys, for the show. Thank you. Appreciate that.